Section 17 of the Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1 by abdul baha abbas section seventeen five may second nineteen twelve at hotel plaza chicago illinois notes by joseph h hannan in this cause consultation is of vital importance but spiritual conference and not the mere voicing of personal views is intended in france I was present at a session of the Senate, but the experience was not impressive. Parliamentary procedure should have for its object the attainment of the light of truth upon questions presented and not furnish a battleground for opposition and self-opinion. Antagonism and contradiction are unfortunate and always destructive to truth. In the parliamentary meeting mentioned, altercation and useless quibbling were frequent. The result, mostly confusion and turmoil. Even in one instance, a physical encounter took place between two members. It was not consultation, but comedy. The purpose is to emphasize the statement that consultation must have for its object the investigation of truth. He who expresses an opinion should not voice it as correct and right, but set it forth as a contribution to the consensus of opinion. For the light of reality becomes apparent when two opinions coincide. A spark is produced when flint and steel come together. Man should weigh his opinions with the utmost serenity, calmness, and composure. Before expressing his own views, he should carefully consider the views already advanced by others. If he finds that a previously expressed opinion is more true and worthy, he should accept it immediately and not willfully hold to an opinion of his own. By this excellent method, he endeavors to arrive at unity and truth. Opposition and division are deplorable. It is better then to have the opinion of a wise, sagacious man. Otherwise, contradiction and altercation in which varied and divergent views are presented will make it necessary for a judicial body to render decision upon the question. Even a majority opinion or consensus may be incorrect. A thousand people may hold to one view and be mistaken, whereas one sagacious person may be right. Therefore, true consultation is spiritual conference in the attitude and atmosphere of love. Members must love each other in the spirit of fellowship in order that good results may be forthcoming. Love and fellowship are the foundation. The most memorable instance of spiritual consultation was the meeting of the disciples of Jesus Christ upon the mount after his ascension. They said, quote, His Holiness Jesus Christ has been crucified and we have no longer association and intercourse with him in his physical body. Therefore, we must be loyal and faithful to him. We must be grateful and appreciate him, for he has raised us from the dead. He made us wise. He has given us eternal life. What shall we do to be faithful to him? End quote. And so they held counsel. One of them said, quote, we must detach ourselves from the chains and fetters of the world. Otherwise, we cannot be faithful, end quote. The others replied, quote, that is so, end quote. Another said, quote, either we must be married 
and faithful to our wives and children or serve our lord free from these ties we cannot be occupied with the care and provision for families and at the same time herald the kingdom in the wilderness therefore let those who are unmarried remain so and those who have married provide means of sustenance and comfort for their families and then go forth to spread the message of glad tidings end quote. there were no dissenting voices all agreed saying that is right a third disciple said quote, to perform worthy deeds in the kingdom we must be further self-sacrificing from now on we should forgo ease and bodily comfort accept every difficulty forget self and teach the cause of god end quote this found acceptance and approval by all the others finally a fourth disciple said quote, there is still another aspect to our faith and unity for jesus sake we shall be beaten imprisoned and exiled they may kill us let us receive this lesson now let us realize and resolve that though we are beaten banished cursed spat upon and led forth to be killed we shall accept all this joyfully loving those who hate and wound us end quote. and the disciples replied quote, surely we will it is agreed this is right end quote. then they descended from the summit of the mountain and each went forth in a different direction upon his divine mission this was true consultation this was spiritual consultation and not the mere voicing of personal views in parliamentary opposition and debate six may second nineteen twelve at hotel la salle chicago illinois federation of women's clubs notes by joseph h hannon one of the functions of the sun is to quicken and reveal the hidden realities of the kingdoms of existence through the light and heat of the great central luminary all that is potential in the earth is awakened and comes forth into the realm of the visible the fruit hidden in the tree appears upon its branches in response to the power of the sun man and all other organisms live move and have their being under its developing rays nature is resplendent with countless evolutionary forms through its pervading impulse so that we can say a function of the sun is the revelation of the mysteries and creative purposes hidden within the phenomenal world the outer sun is a sign or symbol of the inner and ideal sun of truth the word of god inasmuch as this is the century of light it is evident that the sun of reality the word has revealed itself to all humankind one of the potentialities hidden in the realm of humanity was the capability or capacity of womanhood through the effulgent rays of divine illumination the capacity of woman has become so awakened and manifest in this age that equality of man and woman is an established fact in past ages woman was wronged and oppressed this was especially the case in asia and africa in certain parts of asia women were not considered as members of humankind they were looked upon as inferior unworthy creatures subordinate and subjective to man a certain people known as the nusarians held to the belief for a long period that woman was the incarnation of the evil spirit or satan and that man alone was the manifestation of god the merciful at last this century of light dawned the realities shone forth and the mysteries long hidden from human vision 
were revealed. Among these revealed realities was the great principle of the equality of man and woman, which is now finding recognition throughout the whole world, America, Europe, and the Orient. History records the appearance in the world of women who have been signs of guidance, power, and accomplishment. Some were notable poets, some philosophers and scientists, others courageous upon the field of battle. Qurratul Ain was a Baha'i, was a poetess. She discomfited the learned men of Persia by her brilliancy and fervor. When she entered a meeting, even the learned were silent. She was so well versed in philosophy and science that those in her presence always considered and consulted her first. Her courage was unparalleled. She faced her enemies fearlessly until she was killed. She withstood a despotic king, the Shah of Persia, who had the power to decree the death of any of his subjects. There was not a day during which he did not command the execution of some. This woman, singly and alone, withstood such a despot until her last breath, then gave her life for her faith. Consider the mysteries revealed during the last half century, all due to the effulgence of the sun of reality, which has been so gloriously manifested in this age and cycle. In this day, man must investigate the reality impartially and without prejudice in order to reach the true knowledge and conclusion. What then constitutes the inequality between man and woman? Both are human. In powers and function, each is the complement of the other. At most, it is this, that woman has been denied the opportunities which man has so long enjoyed, especially the privilege of education. But even this is not always a shortcoming. Shall we consider it an imperfection and weakness in her nature, that she is not proficient in the school of military tactics, that she cannot go forth to the field of battle and kill, that she is not able to handle a deadly weapon, Nay, rather, is it not a compliment when we say that in hardness of heart and cruelty she is inferior to man? The woman who is asked to arm herself and kill her fellow creatures will say, I cannot. Is this to be considered a fault and lack of qualification as man's equal? Yet be it known that if woman had been taught and trained in the military science of slaughter, she would have been the equivalent of man, even in this accomplishment. But God forbid, may woman never attain this proficiency. May she never wield weapons of war. For the destruction of humanity is not a glorious achievement. The upbuilding of a home, the bringing of joy and comfort into human hearts are truly glories of mankind. Let not a man glory in this, that he can kill his fellow creatures. Nay, rather, let him glory in this, that he can love them. When we consider the kingdoms of existence below man, we find no distinction or estimate of superiority and inferiority, male and female. Among the myriad organisms of the vegetable and animal kingdoms, sex exists, but there is no differentiation whatever as to relative importance and value in the equation of life. If we investigate impartially, we may even find species in which the female is superior or preferable to the male. For instance, there are trees such as the fig, the male of which is fruitless, while the female is fruitful. The male of the date palm is valueless, while the female bears abundantly. Inasmuch as we find no ground for distinction or superiority, according to the creative wisdom in the lower kingdoms, 
is it logical or becoming of man to make such distinction in regard to himself the male of the animal kingdom does not glory in its being male and superior to the female in fact equality exists and is recognized why should man a higher and more intelligent creature deny and deprive himself of this equality the animals enjoy his surest index and guide as to the creative intention concerning himself are the conditions and analogies of the kingdoms below him where equality of the sexes is fundamental the truth is that all mankind are the creatures and servants of one god and in his estimate are all human man is a generic term applying to all humanity the biblical statement quote, let us make man in our image after our likeness end quote, does not mean that woman was not created the image and likeness of god applies to her as well in persian and arabic there are two distinct words translated man into english one meaning man and woman collectively the other distinguishing man as male from woman the female the first word and its pronoun are generic collective the other is restricted to the male this is the same in hebrew to accept and observe a distinction which god has not intended in creation is ignorance and superstition the fact which is to be considered however is that woman having formerly been deprived must now be allowed equal opportunities with man for education and training there must be no difference in their education until the reality of equality between man and woman is fully established and attained the highest social development of mankind is not possible even granted that woman is inferior to man in some degree of capacity or accomplishment this or any other distinction would continue to be productive of discord and trouble the only remedy is education opportunity for equality means equal qualification in brief the assumption of superiority by man will continue to be depressing to the ambition of woman as if her attainment to equality was creationally impossible woman's aspiration toward advancement will be checked by it and she will gradually become hopeless on the contrary we must declare that her capacity is equal even greater than man's this will inspire her with hope and ambition and her susceptibilities for advancement will continually increase she must not be told and taught that she is weaker and inferior in capacity and qualification if a pupil is told that his intelligence is less than his fellow pupils it is a very great drawback and handicap to his progress he must be encouraged to advance by the statement you are most capable and if you endeavor you will attain the highest degree it is my hope that the banner of equality may be raised throughout the five continents where as yet it is not fully recognized and established in this enlightened world of the west woman has advanced an immeasurable degree beyond the women of the orient and let it be known once more that until woman and man recognize and realize equality social and political progress here or anywhere will not be possible for the world of humanity consists of two parts or members one is woman the other is man until these two members are equal in strength the oneness of humanity cannot be established and the happiness and felicity of mankind will not be a reality god willing this is to be so end of section 17
Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in Oxford, England.